Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 4, Side 1. From Leonardo he passed to Fra Bartolomeo, visited him in his cell at San Marco, wondered at the tender expression, the warm feeling, the soft contours, the harmonious composition, the deep, full colors of the melancholy friar's art. Fra Bartolomeo would visit Raphael in Rome in 1514 and wonder in his turn at the swift descent of the modest artist to the pinnacle of fame in the capital of the Christian world. Raphael became great partly because he could steal with the innocence of Shakespeare, could try one method and manner after another, take from each its precious element, and blend these gleanings in the fever of creation into a style unmistakably his own. Bit by bit he absorbed the rich tradition of Italian painting. Soon he would bring it to fulfillment. Already in his Fiorentine period, from 1504 to 1505, and from 1506 to 1507, he was painting pictures now famous throughout Christendom and beyond. The Budapest Museum has a portrait of a young man, perhaps a self-portrait, with the same beret and side glance of the eyes as in the Alto Ritratto of the Pitti Gallery. When Raphael was but twenty-three, he painted the lovely Madonna del Granduca, also in the Pitti, whose perfectly oval face and silken hair and small mouth and Leonardesque eyelids lowered in pensive affection were fra framed in a warm contrast of green veil and red robe. Ferdinand II, Grand Duke of Tuscany, found such pleasure in contemplating this picture that he took it with him on his travels, whence its name. Quite as beautiful as the Madonna del Cardellino of the Goldfinch in the Uffizi. The infant Jesus is no masterpiece of conception of design, but the playful St. John, arriving triumphantly with the captured bird, is a delight to mind and eye, and the face of the Virgin is an unforgettable representation of a young mother's tolerant tenderness. Raphael gave this painting as a wedding present to Lorenzo Nazi. In 1547, an earthquake crushed Nazi's mansion and broke the picture into fragments. The pieces were so cleverly reunited that only a Berenson, seeing it in the Uffizi, could surmise its vicissitudes. The Madonna in the Meadow, in Vienna, is a less successful variant. Here, however, Raphael gives us a remarkable landscape, bathed in the soft blue light of an evening falling quietly upon green fields, unruffled stream, towered town, and far-off hills. La Belle Jardinière, in the Louvre, hardly deserves to be the most famous of the Florentine Madonnas. It almost duplicates the Madonna of the Meadow, makes the Baptist absurd from nose to foot, and only redeems itself with an ideal infant standing with chubby feet upon the Virgin's bare foot, looking up at her with loving confidence. The last and most ambitious of them in this period was the Madonna del Baldacchino in the Pitti, the Virgin Mother enthroned under a canopy, or Baldacchino, with two angels parting its folds, two saints at each side, two angels singing at her feet, all in all a conventional performance, famous only because it is Raphael's. In 1505 he interrupted his stay in Florence to visit Perugia and execute two commissions there. For the nuns of St. Anthony, he painted an altarpiece, which is now one of the most precious pictures in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Within a frame, beautifully carved, the Virgin sits on a throne, looking like Wordsworth's nun breathless with adoration. In her lap, the child raises a hand to bless the infant St. John. Two exquisite female figures, St. Cecilia and St. Catherine of Alexandria, flank the Virgin. In the foreground, St. Peter frowns and St. Paul reads and above, in a lunette, God the Father, surrounded by angels, blesses the mother of his son, and with one hand upholds the world. In one panel of the predella, Christ prays on the Mount of Olives while the apostles sleep, and in another, Mary supports the dead Christ while Magdalene kisses his pierced feet. The perfect composition of the ensemble, the appealing figures of the female saints, meditative and wistful, the powerful conception of the passionate Peter, and the unique vision of Christ on the mount, make this Colonna Madonna the first indubitable masterpiece of Raphael. In that same year of 1506, he painted a less imposing picture, a Madonna, now in the National Gallery in London, for the Ansidei family. 
The Virgin, straightly enthroned, teaches the child how to read. At her left, St. Nicholas of Bari, gorgeous in his episcopal robes, is also studious. At her right, the Baptist, suddenly thirty while his playmate is still an infant, points the traditional finger of the forerunner at the Son of God. From Perugia, Raphael seems to have gone again to Urbino in 1506. Now he painted for Guido Baldo a second St. George, now in Leningrad, this time with a lance, a handsome young knight sheathed in armor whose gleaming blue displays another phase of Raphael's skill. Probably on the same visit he painted for his friends the most familiar of his self-portraits, now in the Piti. Black beret over long black locks, face still youthful, and with no trace yet of beard, long nose, small mouth, soft eyes. Altogether a haunting face that might have been Keats's, revealing a spirit clean and fresh and sensitive to every beauty in the world. Late in 1506 he returned to Florence. There he painted some of his less renowned pictures— St. Catherine of Alexandria, now in London, and the Nicolini Cooper Madonna and Child, now in Washington. About 1780, the third Earl Cooper smuggled this out of Florence in the lining of his carriage. It is not one of Raphael's finest, but Andrew Mellon paid $850,000 to add it to his collection in 1928. A far greater picture was begun by Raphael at Florence in 1507, the Entombment of Christ, now in the Borghese Gallery. It was ordered for the Church of San Francesco in Perugia by Atalanta Baglioni, who, seven years before, had knelt in the street over her own dying son. Perhaps through Mary's grief she expressed her own. Taking Perugino's deposition as his model, Raphael grouped his figures in a masterly composition, almost with the power of Montaigne, the emaciated dead Christ, born in a sheet by a virile and muscular youth and a bearded straining man, a splendid head of Joseph of Arimathea, a lovely Magdalene leaning in horror over the corpse, Mary fainting into the arms of attendant women. Every body in a different attitude, yet all rendered with anatomical verity and Corregian grace. A somber symphony of reds, blues, browns, and greens, mingling in a luminous unity, with a Georgianesque landscape showing the three crosses of Golgotha under an evening sky. In 1508, Raphael received at Florence a call that changed the current of his life. The new Duke of Urbino, Francesco Maria della Rovere, was a nephew of Julius II. Bramante, a distant relative of Raphael, was now a favorite with the Pope. Apparently both the Duke and the architect recommended Raphael to Julius. Soon an invitation was sent the young painter to come to Rome. He was glad to go, for Rome, not Florence, was now the exciting and stimulating center of the Renaissance world. Julius, who had lived for four years in the Borgia apartment, had tired of seeing Giulia Farnese playing virgin on the wall. He wished to move into the four chambers once used by the admirable Nicholas V, and he wanted these stanze or rooms to be decorated with paintings congenial to his heroic stature and aims. In the summer of 1508, Raphael went to Rome. 2. Raphael and Julius II, 1508-1513 Rarely since Phidias had so many great artists gathered in one city and year. Michelangelo was carving figures for Julius's gigantic tomb and was painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Bramante was designing the new St. Peter's. Fra Giovanni of Verona, master woodworker, was carving doors and chairs and bosses for the stanze. Perugino, Signorelli, Peruzzi, Sodoma, Lotto, Pinturicchio had already painted some of the walls and Ambrogio Foppa, called Cardosa, the Cellini of his age, was making gold in every way. Julius assigned to Raphael the Stanza della Segnatura, so-called because usually in this room the Pope heard appeals and signed pardons. He was so pleased with the youth's first paintings here, and saw in him so excellent and pliable an agent to execute the grand conceptions that seethed in the papal brain, that he dismissed Perugino, Signorelli, and Sodoma, ordered their paintings whitewashed, and offered to Raphael the opportunity to paint all the walls of the four rooms. Raphael persuaded the Pope to retain some of the work done by the earlier artists. Most of it, however, was covered over, so that the major paintings might have the unity of one mind and hand. For each room, Raphael received twelve hundred ducats, or about fifteen thousand dollars, and on the two rooms that he did for Julius, he spent four and a half years. 
He was now twenty-six. The plan for the Stanza della Signatura was lordly and sublime. The paintings were to represent the union of religion and philosophy, of classic culture and Christianity, of church and state, of literature and law, in the civilization of the Renaissance. Probably the Pope conceived the general plan and chose the subjects in consultation with Raphael and the scholars of his court, Ingarami and Sodaletto, later Bembo and Bibiena. In the great semicircle formed by one side wall, Raphael pictured religion in the persons of the Trinity and the saints, and theology in the form of the fathers and doctors of the Church discussing the nature of the Christian faith as centered in the doctrine of the Eucharist. How carefully he prepared himself for this first test of his ability to paint on a monumental scale may be seen from the thirty preliminary studies that he made for this Disputa del Sacramento. He recalled Fra Bartolomeo's last judgment in Santa Maria Nuova at Florence and his own adoration of the Trinity in San Severo at Perugia, and on them he modeled his design. The result was a panorama so majestic as almost to convert the most obdurate skeptic to the mysteries of the faith. At the top of the arch, radial lines converging upward make the uppermost figures seem to bend forward. At the bottom, the converging lines of a marble pavement give the picture depth. At the summit, God the Father, a solemn, kindly Abraham, holds up the globe with one hand and with the other blesses the scene. Below him, the sun sits, naked to the waist, as in a shell. On his right, Mary in humble adoration. On his left, the Baptist, still carrying his shepherd's staff, crowned with a cross. Beneath him, a dove represents the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. Everything is here. Seated on a fluffy cloud around the Savior are twelve magnificent figures of Old Testament or Christian history. Adam, a bearded Michelangelesque athlete, almost nude. Abraham, a stately Moses holding the tables of the law. David, Judas Maccabeus, Peter and Paul, St. John writing his Evangel, St. James the Greater, St. Stephen, St. Lawrence, and two others of debated identity. Among them and in the clouds, everywhere except in the beards, cherubim and seraphim dart in and out, and angels weave through the air on the wings of song. Dividing and uniting this celestial assembly from an earthly throng below are two cherubim holding the gospel, and a monstrance displaying the host. Around this a varied assemblage of theologians gathers to consider the problems of theology. St. Jerome with his Vulgate and his Lion, St. Augustine dictating the city of God, St. Ambrose in his Episcopal robes, Popes Anacletus and Innocent III, the philosophers Aquinas, Bonaventura, and Duns Scotus, the doer Dante crowned as if with thorns, the gentle Fra Angelico, the angry Savonarola, another Julian revenge on Alexander VI, and finally, in a corner, bald and ugly, Raphael's protecting friend Bramante. In all these human figures, the young artist has achieved an astonishing degree of individualization, making each face a credible biography, and in many of them a degree of superhuman dignity ennobles the whole picture and theme. Probably never before had painting so successfully conveyed the epic sublimity of the Christian creed. But could the same youth, now twenty-eight, represent with equal force and grandeur the role of science and philosophy among men? We have no evidence that Raphael had ever done much reading. He spoke with his brush and listened with his eyes. He lived in a world of form and color in which words were trivial things unless they issued in the significant actions of men and women. He must have prepared himself by hurried study, by dipping into Plato and Diogenes Laertius and Marsilio Ficino, and by humble conversation with learned men, to rise now to his supreme conception, the school of Athens, half a hundred figures summing up rich centuries of Greek thought, and all gathered in an immortal moment under the coffered arch of a massive pagan portico. There on the wall directly facing the apotheosis of theology in the Disputa is the glorification of philosophy, Plato of the Jove-like brow, deep eyes, flowing white hair and beard, with the finger pointing upward to his perfect state. Aristotle, walking quietly beside him, thirty years younger, handsome and cheerful, holding out his hand with downward palm, 
as if to bring his master's soaring idealism back to earth and the possible. Socrates, counting off his arguments on his fingers, with armed Alcibiades listening to him lovingly. Pythagoras trying to imprison in harmonic tables the music of the spheres. A fair lady who might be Aspasia. Heraclitus writing Ephesian riddles. Diogenes lying carelessly disrobed on the marble steps. Archimedes drawing geometries on a slate for four absorbed youths. Ptolemy and Zoroaster bandying globes. A boy at the left running up eagerly with books, surely seeking an autograph. An assiduous lad seated in a corner taking notes. Peeking out at the left, little Federigo of Mantua, Isabella's son and Julius's pet. Bramante again. And hiding modestly, almost unseen, Raphael himself, now sprouting a mustache. There are many more about whose identity we shall let leisurely pundits dispute. All in all, such a parliament of wisdom had never been painted, perhaps never been conceived before. And not a word about heresy. No philosophers burned at the stake. Here, under the protection of a pope too great to fuss about the difference between one error and another, the young Christian has suddenly brought all these pagans together, painted them in their own character and with remarkable understanding and sympathy, and placed them where the theologians could see them and exchange fallibilities, and where the pope, between one document and another, might contemplate the cooperative process and creation of human thought. This painting and the disputa are the ideal of the Renaissance, pagan antiquity and Christian faith living together in one room and harmony. These rival panels, in the sum of their conception, composition, and technique, are the apex of European painting, to which no man has ever risen again. A third wall remained, smaller than the other two, and so broken by a casement window that unity of pictorial subject seemed impossible there. It was a brilliant choice to let that surface picture poetry and music. So a chamber heavily laden with theology and philosophy was made light and bright with the world of harmonious imagination, and gentle melodies could sing silently through the centuries across that room where unappealable decisions gave life or death. In this fresco of Parnassus, Apollo, seated under some laurel trees atop the sacred mount, draws from his vial ditties of no tone, and at his right a muse reclines in graceful ease, bearing a lovely breast to the saints and sages on the adjacent walls. And Homer recites his hexameters in blind ecstasy, and Dante looks with unreconciled severity even at this goodly company of graces and bards. And Sappho, too beautiful to be lesbian, strums her Cythera. And Virgil, Horace, Ovid, Tibullus, and other singers chosen by time mingle with Petrarch, Boccaccio, Ariosto, Sanazzaro, and lesser voices of more recent Italy. So the young artist suggested that life without music would be a mistake, and that the strains and visions of poetry might lift men to heights as lofty as the myopia of wisdom and the impudence of theology. On the fourth wall, also pierced by a window, Raphael honored the place of law in civilization. In the lunette, he painted figures of prudence, force, and moderation. On one side of the casement, he represented civil law in the form of the Emperor Justinian promulgating the pandects, and on the other, canon law in the person of Pope Gregory the Ninth promulgating the decretals. Here, to flatter his irascible master, he pictured Julius as Gregory and achieved another powerful portrait. In the circles, hexagons, and rectangles of the ornate ceiling, he painted little masterpieces like the Judgment of Solomon and symbolic figures of theology, philosophy, jurisprudence, astronomy, and poetry. With these and similar cameos, and some medallions left by Sodoma, the great Stanza della Signatura was complete. Raphael had exhausted himself there and never attained to such colossal excellence again. By 1511, when he began the next room, now called the Stanza del Iodoro, from its central picture, the conceptual inspiration of Pope and artist seemed to lose force and fire. Julius could hardly be expected to dedicate his entire apartment to a glorification of a union between classic culture and Christianity. It was natural now that he should devote a few walls to commemorating scenes in scriptural and Christian story. Perhaps to symbolize his expected expulsion of the French from Italy, he chose for one side of the chamber the vivid description, in the second book of the Maccabees, of how Heliodorus and his pagan cohorts, attempting to abscond with the treasury of the Jerusalem temple in 186 B.C., 
were overwhelmed by three angel warriors. Against an architectural background of great pillars and receding arches, the high priest Onias, kneeling at the altar, begs divine aid. On the right, a mounted angel, with irresistible wrath, tramples down the robber general, while two other heavenly rescuers advance to attack the fallen infidel, whose stolen coins spill out upon the pavement. On the left, with sublime disdain of chronology, Julius II sits enthroned in calm majesty, watching the expulsion of the invaders. At his feet, a crowd of Jewish women mingle incongruously with Raphael, now bearded and solemn, and his friends Marc Antonio Raimondi, the engraver, and Giovanni di Foliari, a member of the papal secretariat. It is hardly as exalting a fresco as the Disputa, or the School of Athens. It is too visibly devoted, at the cost of compositional unity, to the celebration of one pontiff and a passing theme. But it is still a masterpiece, vibrating with action, stately with architecture, and almost rivaling Michelangelo in the display of angry and muscular anatomies. On another wall, Raphael painted the Mass of Balsena. About 1263, a Bohemian priest of Balsena, near Orvieto, who had doubted that the sacramental wafer was really transformed into the body and blood of Christ, was amazed to see drops of blood ooze from the host that he had just consecrated in the Mass. In commemoration of this miracle, Pope Urban IV ordered the erection of a cathedral at Orvieto, and the annual celebration of the Corpus Christi feast. Raphael painted the scene with brilliance and mastery. The priestly skeptic gazes at the bleeding host, while the acolytes behind him start at the sight. Women and children at one side, Swiss guards at the other, unable to see the miracle, are visibly unmoved. Cardinals Riario and Schinner and other ecclesiastics stare at the scene in mingled astonishment and terror. Across from the altar, kneeling on a prie dieu, carved with grotesques, Julius II looks on in quiet dignity, as if he had known all along that the host would bleed. Technically, this is one of the best of the stanze frescoes. Raphael has distributed his figures skillfully around and above the window that mounts into the wall. He has also designed them with firmness of line and careful execution, and he has brought to flesh and drapery a new depth and warmth of coloring. The figure of the kneeling Julius is a revealing portrait of the Pope in his final year. Still the warrior strong and stern, still the proud king of kings, he is a man worn with his toils and combats, clearly marked for death. During these major labors, from 1508 to 1513, Raphael produced several memorable Madonnas. The Virgin with the Diadem in the Louvre reverts to the Umbrian style of modest piety. The Madonna della Casa Alba, literally the Lady of the White House, is a graceful study in pink and green and gold, with the large and flowing lines of Michelangelo's Sibyls. Andrew Mellon contributed $1,166,400 to the Soviet government in exchange for this picture in 1936. The Madonna di Foligno, in the Vatican, shows a lovely virgin and child in the clouds, a ghastly Baptist pointing to her, a stout St. Jerome presenting to her the donor of the picture, Sigismondo de Conti of Foligno and Rome. Here, Raphael, under the influence of the Venetian Sebastiano del Piombo, achieves a new splendor of luminous color. The Madonna della Pesce in the Prado is altogether beautiful. In the face and mood of the Virgin, in the child, never surpassed by Raphael. In the youthful Tobit, presenting to Mary the fish whose liver has restored his father's sight. In the robe of the angel who guides him, in the patriarchal head of St. Jerome. In composition, color, and light, this painting can bear comparison with the Sistine Madonna itself. Finally, Raphael in this period raised portrait painting to a height that only Titian would reach again. The portrait was a characteristic product of the Renaissance and corresponds to the proud liberation of the individual in that flamboyant age. Raphael's portraits are not numerous, but they all stand on the highest level of the art. One of the finest is Bindo Altoviti. Who could surmise that this gentle but alert youth, healthy and clear-eyed, and as pretty as a girl, was no poet but a banker, and a generous patron of artists from Raphael to Cellini. He was twenty-two when so portrayed. In 1556 he died at Rome after a noble but disastrous and exhausting effort to save the independence of Siena from Florence. And of course to this period belongs the greatest of all portraits, the Julius II of the Uffizi Gallery, from circa 1512. We cannot say that this is the original that first came from Raphael's hand. 
Possibly it is a studio replica, and the marvelous copy in the Pitti Palace was made by none other than that rival portraitist, Titian. The fate of the original is unknown. Julius himself died before the Stanza de Leodoro was finished, and Raphael wondered whether the great plan of the four Stanze would be carried out. But how could a pope like Leo X, wedded to art and poetry almost as deeply as to religion, hesitate? The young man from Urbino was to find in Leo his most loyal friend. The living genius of happiness was to know, under a happy pope, his happiest years. 4. Michelangelo 1. Youth, 1475-1505 We have left to the last Julius's favorite painter and sculptor, a man rivaling him in temper and terribilita, in power and depth of spirit, the greatest and saddest artist in the records of mankind. Michelangelo's father was Lodovico di Leonardo Buonarroti Simoni, Odesta, or mayor, of the little town of Caprese, on the road from Florence to Arezzo. Lodovico claimed distant kinship with the Counts of Canossa, one of whom was pleased to acknowledge the relation. Michael always prided himself on having a liter or two of noble blood, but ruthless research has proved him mistaken. Born at Caprese on March 6, 1475, and named, like Raphael, after an archangel, Michelangelo was the second of four brothers. He was put out to nurse near a marble quarry at Settignano, so that he breathed the dust of sculpture from his birth. He remarked later that he had sucked in chisels and hammers with his nurse's milk. When he was six months old, the family moved to Florence. He received some schooling there, enough to enable him in after years to write good Italian verse. He learned no Latin, and never fell so completely under the hypnosis of antiquity as did many artists of the time. He was Hebraic, not classic, Protestant in spirit, rather than Catholic. He preferred drawing to writing, which is a corruption of drawing. His father mourned the preference, but finally yielded to it, and apprenticed Michael, aged thirteen, to Domenico Ghirlandaio, then the most popular painter in Florence. The contract bound the youth to stay with Domenico three years to learn the art of painting. He was to receive six florins the first year, eight the second, ten the third, and presumably shelter and food. The boy supplemented Ghirlandaio's instruction by keeping his eyes open as he wandered through Florence, seeing in everything some object for art. Thus, reports his friend Condivi, he used to frequent the fish market and study the shape and hues of fish's fins, the color of their eyes, and so for every part belonging to them, all which details he reproduced with the utmost diligence in his painting. He had been with Ghirlandaio hardly a year when a combination of nature and chance turned him to sculpture. Like many other art students, he had free access to the gardens in which the Medici had disposed their collections of antique statuary and architecture. He must have copied some of these marbles with a special interest and skill, for when Lorenzo, wishing to develop a school of sculpture in Florence, asked Ghirlandaio to send him some students of promise in that direction, Domenico gave him Francesco Granacci and Michelangelo Buonarroti. The boy's father hesitated to let him make the change from one art to the other, he feared that his son would be put to cutting stone. And indeed, Michael was so used for a time, blocking out marble for the Laurentian library. But soon the boy was carving statues. All the world knows the story of Michael's marble fawn, how he chiseled a stray piece into the figure of an old fawn, how Lorenzo, passing, remarked that so old a fawn would hardly have so complete a set of teeth, and how Michael remedied the fault at one blow by knocking a tooth out of the upper jaw. Pleased with the boy's product and aptitude, Lorenzo took him into his home and treated him as his son. For two years, from 1490 to 1492, the young artist lived in the Palazzo Medici, regularly ate at the same table with Lorenzo, Politian, Pico, Ficino, and Pulci, heard the most enlightened talk about politics, literature, philosophy, and art. Lorenzo assigned him a good room, allowed him five ducats, or about $62.50 a month for his personal expenses. Whatever works of art Michael might produce remained his own, to dispose of as he wished. These years in the Medici Palace might have been a period of pleasant growth, had it not been for Pietro Torrigiano. Pietro one day took offense at Michael's banter, and, so he told Cellini, 
Clenching my fist, I gave him such a blow on the nose that I felt bone and cartilage go down like biscuit beneath my knuckles, and this mark of mine he will carry to the grave. It was so. Michelangelo, for the next seventy-four years, showed a nose broken at the bridge. It did not sweeten his temper. In those same years, Savonarola was preaching his fiery gospel of Puritan reform. Michael went often to hear him and never forgot those sermons, or the cold thrill that ran through his youthful blood as the prior's angry cry, announcing the doom of corrupt Italy, pierced the stillness of the crowded cathedral. When Savonarola died, something of his spirit lingered in Michelangelo, a horror of the moral decay about him, a fierce resentment of despotism, a somber presentiment of doom. Those memories and fears shared in forming his character, in guiding his chisel and his brush. Lying on his back under the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he remembered Savonarola. Painting the last judgment, he resurrected him and hurled the friar's fulminations down the centuries. In 1492, Lorenzo died, and Michael returned to his father's house. He continued his sculpture and painting, and now added a strange experience to his education. The prior of the Hospital of Santo Spirito allowed him, in a private room, to dissect corpses. Michael performed so many dissections that his stomach revolted, and for a time he could hardly hold any food or drink. But he learned anatomy. He had an absurd chance to show his knowledge when Piero de' Medici asked him to mold a gigantic snowman in the court of the palace. Michael complied, and Piero persuaded him to live again in the Casa Medici, this in January of 1494. Late in 1494, Michelangelo, in one of his many hectic moves, fled through the winter snow of the Apennines to Bologna. One story says that he was warned of Piero's coming fall by the dream of a friend. Perhaps his own judgment predicted that event. In any case, Florence might not then be safe for one so favored by the Medici. At Bologna, he studied carefully the reliefs by Jacopo della Quercia on the façade of San Petronio. He was engaged to finish the tomb of St. Dominic, and carved for it a graceful kneeling angel. Then the organized sculptors of Bologna sent him warning that if he, a foreigner and interloper, continued to take work out of their hands, they would dispose of him by one or another of the many devices open to Renaissance initiative. Meanwhile, Savonarola had taken charge of Florence, and virtue was in the air. Michael returned in 1495. He found a patron in Lorenzo di Pier Francesco, of the collateral branch of the Medici, for him, he carved a sleeping Cupid, which had a strange history. Lorenzo suggested that he treat the surface to make it look like an antique. Michael complied. Lorenzo sent it to Rome, where it was sold for thirty ducats to a dealer who sold it for two hundred to Raffaello Riario, Cardinal di San Giorgio. The Cardinal discovered the cheat, sent back the Cupid, recovered his ducats. It was later sold to Caesar Borgia, who gave it to Guido Baldo of Urbino. Caesar reclaimed it on taking that city and sent it to Isabella d'Este, who described it as without a peer among the works of modern times. Its later history is unknown. With all his versatile ability, Michael found it hard to earn a living by art in a city where there were almost as many artists as citizens. An agent of Riario invited him to Rome, assuring him that the cardinal would give him employment and that Rome was full of wealthy patrons. So in 1496, Michelangelo moved hopefully to the capital and received a place in the household of the cardinal. Riario did not prove generous, but Jacopo Gallo, a banker, commissioned Michael to carve a Bacchus and a Cupid. One is in the Bargello at Florence, the other in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. The Bacchus is an unpleasant representation of the young god of wine in a state of bibbling intoxication. The head is too small for the body, as may be fitting in a toper but the body is well designed and smooth with an androgynous softness of texture. The Cupid is a crouching youth, more like an athlete than a god of love. Perhaps Michelangelo did not name it so incongruously. As sculpture, it is excellent. Here, almost at the outset, the artist distinguished his work by showing the figure in a moment and attitude of action. The Greek preference for repose in art was alien to him, except in the Pietà. So, with the same exception, was the Greek flair for universality, for depicting general types. Michelangelo chose rather to portray an individual, imaginary in conception, realistic in detail. He did not imitate the antique, except in costumes. His work was characteristically his own. No renaissance, but a unique creation. 
The greatest product of this first stay in Rome was the Pietà that is now one of the glories of St. Peter's. The contract for it was signed by Cardinal Jean de Villiers, French ambassador at the papal court, in 1498. The fee was to be 450 ducats, or about $5,625. The time allowed, one year, and Michael's banker friend added his own generous guarantees. I, Jacopo Gallo, pledge my word to his most reverent lordship that the said Michelangelo will finish the said work within one year, and that it shall be the finest work in marble which Rome today can show, and that no master of our day shall be able to produce a better. And in like manner I pledge my word to the said Michelangelo that the most reverend cardinal will disperse the payments according to the articles of above engrossed. There are some blemishes in this glorious group of the Virgin Mother holding her dead son in her lap. The drapery seems excessive, the Virgin's head is small for her body, her left hand is extended in an inappropriate gesture, her face is that of a young woman clearly younger than her son. To this last complaint Michelangelo, as reported by Condivi, made answer, You not know that chaste women maintain their freshness far longer than the unchaste? How much more would this be the case with a virgin into whose breast there never crept the least lascivious desire which would affect the body? Nay, I will go further, and hazard the belief that this unsullied bloom of youth, besides being maintained in her by natural causes, may have been miraculously wrought to convince the world of the virginity and perpetual purity of the mother. It is a pleasant and forgivable fancy. The spectator is soon reconciled to that gentle face, untorn by agony, calm in her grief and love, the bereaved mother resigned to the will of God and consoled by holding for some final moments the dear body here cleansed of its wounds, freed from its indignities, resting in the lap of the woman that bore it, and beautiful even in death. All the essence and tragedy and redemption of life are in this simple group, the stream of births by which woman carries on the race, the certainty of death is the penalty for every birth, and the love that ennobles our mortality with kindness and challenges every death with new birth. Francis I was right when he pronounced this the finest achievement of Michelangelo. In all the history of sculpture, no man has ever surpassed it, except perhaps the unknown Greek who carved the Demeter of the British Museum. The success of the Pietà brought Michelangelo not only fame, which he humanly enjoyed, but money, which his relatives were ready to enjoy with him. His father had lost, with the fall of the Medici, the little sinecure that Lorenzo the Magnificent had given him. Michael's older brother had entered a monastery. The two younger brothers were improvident, and Michael now became the main support of the family. He complained of this necessity, but gave generously. Probably because the disordered finances of his relatives called him, he returned to Florence in 1501. A unique assignment came to him in August of that year. The Operai, or Board of Works, at the cathedral, owned a block of Carrara marble thirteen and a half feet high, but so irregularly shaped that it had lain unused for a hundred years. The board asked Michelangelo, could a statue be chiseled out of it? He agreed to try, and on August 16th, the Operai del Duomo and the Arte della Lana, the Wool Guild, signed the contract. That the worthy master Michelangelo has been chosen to fashion, complete, and finish to perfection that male statue called Il Gigante, of nine cubits in height, that the work shall be completed within two years dating from September, at a salary of six golden florins per month, that what is needed for the accomplishment of this task, as workmen, timbers, etc., shall be supplied him by the operai, and when the statue is finished, the opera consuls and the operai shall estimate whether he deserve a larger recompense, and this shall be left to their consciences. The sculptor toiled on the refractory material for two and a half years. With heroic labor he drew from it, using every inch of its height, his David. On January 25, 1504, the operai assembled the council of the leading artists in Florence to consider where Il Gigante, as they called the David, should be placed. Cosimo Roselli, Sandro Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Giuliano and Antonio da Sangallo, Filippino Lippi, David Ghirlandaio, Perugino, Giovanni Pifero, father of Cellini, and Piero di Cosimo. They could not agree, and finally they left the matter to Michelangelo. He asked that the statue be placed on the platform of the Palazzo Vecchio. 
The signory consented, but the task of moving the giant from the workshop near the cathedral to the palazzo took forty men four days. A gateway had to be heightened by breaking a wall above it before the colossus could pass, and twenty-one additional days were spent in raising it into place. For three hundred sixty-nine years it stood on the open and uncovered porch of the palazzo, subject to weather, urchins, and revolution. For in a sense, it was a radical pronunciamento, symbol of the proud restored republic, stern threat to usurpers. The Medici, returning to power in 1513, left it untouched. But in the uprising that again deposed them in 1527, a bench thrown from a window of the palace broke the statue's left arm. Francesco Salviati and Giorgio Vasari, then lads of sixteen, gathered and preserved the pieces, and later a Medici, Duke Cosimo, had these fragments put together and replaced. In 1873, after the statue had suffered erosion from the weather, David was laboriously transferred to the Accademia delle Belle Arti, where it occupies the place of honor as the most popular figure in Florence. It was a tour de force, and as such can hardly be overpraised. The mechanical difficulties were brilliantly overcome. Aesthetically, one may pick a few flaws. The right hand is too large, the neck too long, the left leg over long below the knee, the left buttock does not swell as any proper buttock should. Piero Soderini, head of the Republic, thought the nose excessive. Vasari tells the story, perhaps a legend, how Michelangelo, holding some marble dust in his hand, mounted a ladder, pretended to chisel off a bit of the nose while leaving it intact, and let the marble dust fall from his hand before the gonfalonier, who then pronounced the statue much improved. The total effect of the work silences criticism. The splendid frame, not yet swollen with the muscles of Michelangelo's later heroes, the finished texture of the flesh, the strong yet refined features, the nostrils tense with excitement, the frown of anger and the look of resolution subtly tinged with diffidence as the youth faces the fearsome Goliath and prepares to fill and cast his sling. These share in making the David, with one exception, which should be the Hermes of Praxiteles, but more probably is the Statue of Liberty in the harbor of New York, the most famous statue in the world. Vasari thought it surpassed all other statues ancient and modern, Latin or Greek. The Duomo board paid Michelangelo a total of 400 florins for the David. Allowing for the depreciation of currency between 1400 and 1500, we may equate this roughly at $5,000 in the money of 1952. It seems a rather small sum for 30 months' work. Presumably, he accepted other commissions during that time. Indeed, the board and guild themselves, while David was in process, engaged him to carve statues, six and a half feet high, of the Twelve Apostles, to be placed in the cathedral. He was allowed twelve years for the work, was to be paid two florins a month, and a house was to be built for his free occupancy. Of these statues, the sole survivor is a St. Matthew, only half emerged from the block of stone, like some figure by Rodin. Looking at it in the Florence Academy, we understand better what Michelangelo meant when he defined sculpture as the art that works by force of taking away. And again in one of his poems, In hard and craggy stone the mere removal of the surface gives being to a figure, whichever grows the more the stone is hewn away. He often spoke of himself as searching to find the figure concealed in the stone, knocking the surface away as if seeking a miner buried in fallen rock. About 1505 he carved for a Flemish merchant the Madonna that sits in the church of Notre Dame at Bruges. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.